Good morning, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Fress, and I'll be your host for the next hour. You're listening to FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. We'll continue now our reading and discussion of Martin Luther's work entitled The Babylonian Captivity of the Church. And in this portion of the work, he is uh, stripping the papacy of his powers. And uh, this particular part of the discussion is talking about Rome's so-called impediments to marriage. In other words, grounds that the Pope may grant a divorce or an annulment of a marriage. Martin Luther would strip the Pope of that power, would strip his priests of that power, and uh, Martin Luther detests divorce, and uh, and in the case of the the specific impediment to marriage that we're talking about now is in impotence, that the man is able is unable uh, rather to satisfy his wife or to give her children, and therefore leaving the woman in distress, perpetual distress and lacking satisfaction and lacking the ability to have a child, there ought to be a remedy for the woman, a workable remedy for the couple, if not the woman alone, to satisfy her and to give her children. And uh, Martin Luther is suggesting that rather than divorce, the man ought to give consent to a surrogate father or that she should just leave the relationship and go marry someone else because he has defrauded her. Now, I don't wish to get into a big debate about this. This is more about what Martin Luther is saying with regard to the papacy and the uh, the self-arrogated authority of the popes and the priests of Rome versus the scriptures. And so we'll continue as our as is traditional here to uh, reread the last paragraph that we concluded with at the end of the broadcast Friday, and we'll get on to other matters. Martin Luther says, moreover, if the man that is speaking of the impotent man, uh, the husband of uh, the impotent husband of a wife, moreover, if the man will not give his consent, that is to a surrogate father or agree to the separation, rather than allow the woman to burn, as is recorded in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 9, or to commit adultery, I would counsel her to contract a marriage with another and flee to a distant unknown place, where other counsel could be given to... Uh, what other counsel could be given to one constantly struggling with struggling with the dangers of natural emotions. All right, Martin Luther saying, what other counsel could be given in this case? He says, now I know that there are some troubled by the fact that the children of this secret marriage are not the rightful heirs of their putative father. But if it was done with the consent of the husband, that is the impotent man, then the children will be the, the rightful heirs. If, however, it was done without his knowledge and against his will, then let unbiased Christian reason, or better, charity, decide which one of the two has done the greater injury to the other. The wife alienates the inheritance, but the husband has deceived his wife and has defrauded her completely of her body and her life. Is not the sin of a man who wastes his wife's body and life a greater sin than that of the woman who merely alienates the temporal goods of her husband? Let him therefore agree to a divorce, or else be satisfied with heirs not his own. For by his own fault he deceived an innocent girl and defrauded her both of life and of a full use of her body, besides giving her an almost irresistible cause for committing adultery. Let both be weighed in the same scales. Certainly, 
by every right, fraud should recoil on the fraudulent. In other words, the wrongful partner should suffer the loss. Okay? The man in this case. He says, certainly by every right, fraud should recoil or fall back on the fraudulent, the one who defrauded. And whoever has done an injury must make it good. What is the difference between such a husband and the man who holds another man's wife captive together with her husband? In other words, taking them hostage. Is not such a tyrant compelled to support wife and children and husband, or else to set them free? Why should not the same hold true here? Therefore I maintain that the man should be compelled either to submit to a divorce or to support the other man's child as his heir. Doubtless this would be the judgment of charity. In that case, the impotent man, who is not really the husband, should support the heir of his wife in the same spirit in which at, he would, at great expense, wait on his wife or care for his wife if she fell sick or, or suffered some other ill. For it is by his fault and not his wife's that she suffers this ill. This I would set forth to the best of my ability for the strengthening of anxious consciences because my desire is to bring my afflicted brethren in this, in this captivity what little comfort I can. So this is how Martin Luther would handle the situation of an impotent man, one of the so-called impediments to marry, which the papacy grants divorce and annulments, and Martin Luther has a better way. So, now he moves on to the subject of divorce. He says, as to divorce, it is still a question for debate whether it is allowable. For my part, I so greatly detest divorce that I should prefer bigamy to it. But whether it is allowable, I will not venture to decide. Christ himself, the chief shepherd, says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 32, quote, Everyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of unchastity, makes her an adulteress, and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Unquote. Christ then permits divorce, but only on the ground of unchastity. The Pope must, therefore, be in error whenever he grants a divorce for any other cause, and no one should feel safe who has obtained a dispensation by this temerity, not the authority, but the temerity of the Pope. Yet it is still a greater wonder to me why they compel a man to remain unmarried after being separated from his wife by divorce and why they will not permit him to remarry. For if Christ permits divorce on the ground of unchastity and compels no one to remain unmarried, and if Paul would rather have us marry than to burn, as recorded again in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 9, then he certainly seems to permit a man to marry another woman in the place of the one who has been put away. I wish that this subject were fully discussed and made clear and decided so that counsel might be given in the, infinite peril, uh, in the infinite perils of those who, without any fault of their own, are nowadays compelled to remain unmarried. That is, those whose wives or husbands have run away or deserted them to come back perhaps after ten years or perhaps never. This matter troubles and distresses me for there are daily cases, whether by the special malice of Satan or because of our neglect of the Word of God. So Martin Luther acknowledges that the supreme authority is the Word of God to deal with such matters, even the matters as Satan orchestrates to trip us up. Okay? 
So Martin Luther puts the power on the Word of God and strips it away from the papacy and his priests. And that's the Protestant belief. He was truly Protestant. Now he continues, I indeed, who alone against all, cannot establish any rule in this matter, would yet greatly desire at least the passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 15 to be applied here. Quote, But if the unbelieving partner desires to separate, let it be so. In such a case, a brother or sister is not bound. A brother or sister is not bound. Unquote. Here the apostle gives permission to put away the unbeliever who departs and to set the believing spouse free to marry again. Why should not the same hold true when a believer, that is, a believer in name, but in truth, is as much an unbeliever as the one Paul speaks of, deserts his wife, especially if he intends never to return. I certainly can see no difference between the two, but I believe that if in the Apostles' day an unbelieving deserter had returned and had become a believer or had promised to live again with his believing wife, it would not have been permitted, but he too would have been given the right to marry again. Nevertheless, in these matters I decide nothing, as I have said, although there is nothing that I would rather see decided, since nothing at present more grievously perplexes me and many others with me. I would have nothing decided here on the mere authority of the Pope and the bishops, but if two learned and good men agreed, as in Matthew chapter 18, verse 19 and 20, in the name of Christ, and published their opinion in the spirit of Christ, I should prefer their judgment, even to such councils as are assembled nowadays, famous only for numbers and authority, not for scholarship and saintliness. He's talking about the church councils, uh, the, 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 uh, the, ch the councils of the Roman Catholic Church. <coughs> as in the Council of Nicaea, the Council of Florence, the Council of Trent, all of those councils he would set aside and go by the simple opinions of Bible-believing Christians. Why? Because the Bible is not the basis of the Roman Catholic Church. It's the decrees of men and councils Full well, you reject the commandments of God by keeping your own tradition, and you teach for doctrine the commandments of men. The Roman Catholic Church system is vividly described and specifically referred to in the New Testament. It's a dead ringer. Don't you think the God of heaven who sent his Son to die to redeem us from our sins would tell us specifically about that counterfeit church that would presume to be his representative on earth but would twist everything he says? Certainly, it's spoken of in the scriptures. You know, I, I, I'm reminded of the incident when my sister came to me and she said, now that I know who the Antichrist is, I need to read my Bible all over again. And I said, absolutely, you certainly do but not without first removing the church's glasses because the church teaches in such a way as to protect the papacy and the Roman Catholic Church from the onus of Antichrist. You need to see from the Scriptures, the plainly printed word in the Scriptures, that it speaks of nothing else but the Roman Catholic Church and the papacy as the man of sin. It's vividly described. Okay? Who is it that teaches for doctrine the commandments of men? The Roman Catholic Church. Okay? 
plainly in front of you. All you have to do is first recognize who the Antichrist is. That's the tough part. But once you comprehend that Paul, Daniel, and John were speaking about the Roman Catholic Church and about the papacy, then the New Testament has completely new meaning in some places. Okay, you'll find out, you'll discover that in most of the New Testament, the specific identifying characteristics of the Roman Catholic Church are vividly described. So that if you memorize the scriptures in the first century, before the Roman Catholic Church ever got its rise, you would suddenly see flesh cover the bones of the Antichrist as time proceeded. You would literally see the Antichrist being formed right before your very eyes. If you knew ahead of time, as Daniel tried to tell the Thessalonians, who the Antichrist would be, that, what, that which would come to power after the fall of the Caesars, who were literally restraining the rise of the Antichrist, when the Caesars fell away, they would instantly recognize from the Scriptures what was taking its place. And uh, Martin Luther comprehends this. All right. He would fur the judgment of Bible reading Christians over popes and councils. He knows who the Antichrist is. Now, about ordination. This is one of the other sacraments of the Roman Catholic Church. Remember, I have to remind you again for the record, a sacrament, by definition, if you participate in that sacrament, you have received grace. Okay, so if you've been ordained in the Roman Catholic Church, consecrated by the Pope and his priests and bishops, as, a, as, a, as, as an ordained member of the clergy, you have received grace. Unmerited favor with God if you participate in ordination. Now, Martin Luther telling you, there's no such thing as, as a sacrament. Okay? Grace is a gift, God, not of works, lest any man should boast. He understands the Scripture. But Rome has seven sacraments. Marriage just happens to be one of them. And now ordination. This is where grace is earned. And God is made a debtor to man. Martin Luther rejects the whole sacramental system of the Roman Catholic Church, and rightly so. Now we're going to speak about ordination. Martin Luther says of this sacrament, the Church of Christ, that is, the Church of Christ, as opposed to the Church of Antichrist, the Roman Catholic Church, he says, of this sacrament, the Church of Christ knows nothing. It is, it is an invention of the Church of the Pope. Okay? That's what Martin Luther says categorically about ordination the sacrament of ordination. The sacrament of ordination is unknown in the church of Jesus Christ. It is strictly an invention of the Roman Catholic Church and the papacy. It's a man-made institution. He says, not only is there nowhere any promise of grace attached to it, you must understand, grace is necessary if you're going to call it a sacrament, according to definition. Martin Luther says, not only is there nowhere any promise of grace attached to it, but there's not a single word said about it in the whole New Testament. Now, it is ridiculous to put forth such uh, put, it is ridiculous to put forth as a sacrament of God something that cannot be proved to have been instituted by God. I do not hold that this right, this R-I-T-E, this right, 
which has been observed for so many centuries, should be condemned. But in sacred things, I am opposed to the invention of human fictions. So what, what's he calling ordination? A human fiction. Okay? He's not going to go so far as to condemn it, because he's, he's, he's literally dismantling the entire Roman Catholic system. He's gone quite far enough for the times, hasn't he? You might ask yourself the question, how far would Tom Fresco? Well, I think that's obvious if you're a regular listener. I don't mince words. The entire Roman Catholic system is the system of Antichrist. And I condemn their sacraments, and I condemn their self-arrogated power, their lying power, their hypocritical powers, I condemn that church, and I condemn all of their traditions throughout the centuries. I make no excuse for them. I have no peace with them. I don't condone them. I condemn them, flat out. Okay, and so far as they have crept into the Protestant churches, they should be routed out, root and branch. And we strictly adhere to the written word of God and its authority alone. That is the Protestant belief. That is the Christian belief. Again, he says, I do not hold that this right, ordination, which has been observed for so many centuries, should be condemned. This is where I disagree. But in sacred things, I am opposed to the invention of human fictions. And it's not right give out as divinely instituted what was not divinely instituted, lest we become a laughing stock to our opponents. We ought to see that every article of faith of which we boast is certain, pure, and based on clear passages of Scripture. But we are utterly unable to do that in the case of the sacrament under consideration, ordination. It's not supported in the Scriptures, what Martin Luther is saying. It's strictly a tradition of men. Now he says, the church has no power to make new divine promises of grace, as some prate, who hold that what is decreed by the church is of no less authority than that which is decreed by God, since the church is under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. For the church was born by the word of promise through faith, and by this same word is nourished and preserved. That is to say, it is the promises of God that make the church, and not the church that makes the promises of God. For the word of God is incomparably superior to the church. And in this, in this word, the church, being the creature, has nothing to decree, nothing to ordain, nothing to make but only to be decreed, ordained, and made. For who begets his own parent? Who first brings forth his own maker? Interesting questions, Martin Luther adds. Who first brings forth his own maker? Now, you might find this a little bit departing from the subject at hand, but is that not what the priest pretends to do when he consecrates the wafer? It is said that he is literally the creator of his creator. Who first brings forth his own maker? Nobody, and neither does the priest of Rome when he consecrates wafer, and it becomes God in the hands of the priest. Martin Luther is Protestant, biblical, and right. He may not have been right on every count, but you can tell God has some clay with which he can form into the likeness of his own son. We'll be back right after the message. You're listening to Inquisition Update on First Amendment Radio.
Hear it first on FirstAmendmentRadio.com and FirstAmendmentRadio.net. If you'd like to get a copy of this program, you may subscribe at FirstAmendmentRadio.com for only $45 a month, and you'll receive an MP3 CD weekly of all of our programs. As a bonus, we'll send you a password for our audio archives online. That's a $15 value. Or you may request any month of any program on one MP3 CD for a minimum donation of only $25, or any single program on tape, MP3 CD, or CD for only $15. You may do all of this online at FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Just follow the instructions to make a donation or subscribe. You may also adopt an hour of your favorite program, Please don't forget that most of the programs on FirstAmendmentRadio.com are listener-supported. Don't do Internet? Then call 559-781-3773, and we'll be honored to help you. Thank you from all of us here at FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Since the beginning of time, kings have sought it, nations have fought for it, it has been traded, it has been borrowed, it has been purchased, it has been stolen, there's a reason for it to secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and to our posterity. Invest with the security of gold and silver. Call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188 or visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net. Listen to Financial Survival with your host, Melody Cedarstrom, right here on FirstAmendmentRadio.com at 4 p.m. Eastern or 1 p.m. Pacific Time. Visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net or call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188. Toll free, 1-800-375-4188. Welcome back from the break. You're listening to the second half hour of Inquisition Update on First Amendment Radio. And if you'd like to support Inquisition Update, please support First Amendment Radio, who sponsors it. Now, Martin Luther is plainly telling us that the Roman Catholic Church is not the Church of Jesus Christ. Okay? Sacraments do not exist. They are to the traditions of men. What does exist are the real and true promises of God. God's promise to man. To as many as received him, gave he the power to become the sons of God. That's who Martin Luther is speaking about. Now, he says, this is to say, it is the promises of God that make the church. And not the church that makes the promises of God. What did he just say? That the Roman Catholic Church, who through its sacraments makes the promises of God... It is not the church. Okay? It's God who makes promises. And that makes the church. It is not the church that makes the promises of God. Martin Luther just flatly has stripped the Roman Catholic Church of any and all authority. When it comes to grace, the Roman Catholic Church has no access to it, cannot give it to someone else any more than they can create the promises of God. Okay? Grace is granted when we believe. To as many as received him, that is, believed and received him, to him gave ye the power to become the sons of God. That's a promise. And how is it that we believe? By grace. Even belief is a gift of God. Okay? He says, for the word of God, that is the scripture, is incomparably superior to the church. And in this word, the church, being the creature, has nothing to decree nothing to ordain, nothing to make, but only to be decreed, ordained, and made. The, the scripture says, what, what shall the potter or shall, shall the clay say to the potter, what makest thou? <laughs> Is that not what the Roman Catholic Church does? Okay? 
And he concludes with this marvelous statement. He said, for who begets his own parent? Who first brings forth his own maker? The answer is obvious, but the Roman Catholic Church says it brings forth its own maker every day at the Mass. When the priest consecrates the wafer, he literally becomes the creator of his creator. That is the very basic foundation of the Roman Catholic Church. And Martin Luther has just, by a word only, destroyed it to its very foundation. Do you really think Rome's serious about celebrating the 500th year anniversary of Martin Luther and the Protestant Reformation? Not on your life. So don't be deceived by this ecumenical kumbaya. It's all a head fake. Okay? Don't follow the head. Follow the body. Follow the body of Christ. Now, Martin Luther continues, he says, this one thing indeed the church can do. It can distinguish the word of God from the words of men. Okay? That's what the body of Christ literally does. It can distinguish the word of God, what God has said, as recorded in the scripture, the King James Version of the Bible. They can clearly distinguish that from the quote-unquote infallible words of the church, the Roman Catholic Church. They can distinguish the holy from the profane. That's how you identify the church of Christ. They can distinguish the holy from the profane. They're not deceived. They're not deceived. But who are deceived today? If you'll pardon my expression, the ecumenical evangelibellies. The ones who say we need peace and unity over the truth and we must unite all Christians together in an ecumenical power grab that can liberate the whole world and give it all lock, stock, and barrel on a silver plate to the Pope. To the Pope! That's what they want. Not to Christ. They can't distinguish the holy from the profane. They make no difference between the holy and the profane. Rather, they take the holy and give it over lock, stock, and barrel to the profane. They are not to be followed. They are not to be lauded. They are to be condemned. The one identifying characteristic of the true body of Christ is that it can distinguish the word of God from the words of men. It can distinguish the holy from the profane. It makes a difference between Christ and Antichrist. Others make no distinction. They cannot distinguish the difference. And so they're all alike. And that's why they seek peace and unity where there is no peace. There's no peace in the Church of Rome. Through the sacramental system, you must earn grace. You must make God a debtor. And therefore, grace is no grace. And works is no works. Just as Paul said. Who was he talking about? The Roman Catholic system which he prophesied to come into being just as soon as the restrainer was taken out of the way. And when the pagan Roman Empire fell, and with it the Caesars uprose the holy Roman Empire under the man of sin. And this is his system. And you're 
only maybe hearing this for the first time, but this is the ancient belief and teaching of the true body of Christ throughout history. Throughout all the Christian era. The Roman Catholic Church was opposed by the Thessalonican Church under Paul's ministry centuries before the Holy Roman Empire got its footing. Centuries before the fall of the pagan Roman Empire. The first century church under Paul knew, understood and knew the scriptures and the prophecies better than anyone does today. They were the first anti-papists. And it was thanks to Paul that they understood. Once again, I make reference to the footnotes on, I think, page 155 in the book Romanism and the Reformation by Henry Grattan Guinness, where the early first century Christians prayed fervently for the longevity of the Caesars. Because they knew through Paul's me me message, through Paul's revelation, that that which would replace the Caesars after the fall of the Roman Empire would be that man of sin, that little horn of Daniel, that antichrist of John. And history has left no room for doubt. Martin Luther is leaving no room for doubt. Martin Luther is a latecomer to this belief. This was the historical belief of the true body of Christ, even the first century Christians, long before the papacy ever drew a breath. Centuries before the papacy ever drew a breath. They were able, even before the profane stood up, they were able to distinguish the holy from the profane. Where is that kind of wisdom today? It's like finding a needle in a haystack. And you may think this sounds proud to say, but if you've found Inquisition Update, you've found a needle in the haystack. And it takes no pride to say it. Only humility. I don't boast of the truth because I'm not the author of it. I just believe it. This one thing, indeed, the church can do. It can distinguish the Word of God from the words of filthy, sinful men. The body of Christ, the true body of Christ, can and does distinguish the Word of God from the traditions of the Roman Catholic Church. And it's bold to make that distinction. Not apologetic. Not fearful of rest retribution and persecution and false accusations and criticism and condemnation not fearful of any of it or all of it together the body of Christ can distinguish the Word of God from the wicked words of men he says as Augustine confesses that he believed the gospel because he was moved by the authority of the church which proclaimed that this is the gospel. You know how I believe the gospel? By faith. Not calling God a liar. When I read the scriptures for myself, that's how I received the gospel. That's how I believed. And that's how you should believe too. Don't believe any church because you put the church as your foundation and not Christ in the scriptures. Augustine was a Roman Catholic. He believed the gospel because of the authority of the church, which proclaimed that this is the gospel. Look what that church has done to the gospel that Augustine trusted in. They have destroyed it. They have repudiated it in word and action and deed. Augustine had a rocky foundation. And that rock wasn't Christ. 
It was Antichrist. Now, Martin Luther still has some appreciation for Augustine, but up till now, the church was the authority upon which Martin Luther stood. Now the scriptures and Christ alone are his authority. And I soon expect that Martin Luther will lose some of his respect for Augustine. He continues, he says, Not that the church is therefore above the gospel. If that were true, she would also be above God, in whom we believe, because the church proclaimed that he is God. What church on the earth says that it is of God but the Roman Catholic Church? It makes no bones about it. It says that the Pope can dispense with the Word of God altogether. The, the Roman Catholic Church says by fiat that the Pope is, as it were, God on earth. That church claims to be above the gospel, claims to be above God. Now all you got to do is read Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12 through 15. And you know what he was, the prophet was speaking of. How has Satan exalted his throne above the stars of God? Through the Roman Catholic Church. The papacy is called the man of sin for a reason. He accomplishes that which Satan prophesied he would do in Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12 through 14. He's, Martin Luther says, not that the church is therefore above the gospel. If that were true, she would also be above God, in whom we believe, because the church proclaimed that he is God. But Augustine says elsewhere, quote, the truth itself lays hold on the soul and thus renders it able to judge most certainly of all things. However, the soul is not able to judge the truth, but is compelled to say with unerring certainty that this is the truth. For example, our mind declares with unerring certainty that 3 and 7 are 10. And yet it cannot be, give a reason why this is true, although it cannot deny that it is true. Listen, Augustine, the heavens proclaim the glory of God. Even the very creation declares the glory of God so that none are without excuse. So that none have an excuse. That's how we know the gospel is true. Simply look at his creation. And what man thinks he be Lord over it? The man of sin, of course. He says it is clearly taken captive by the truth, and rather than judging the truth, it is itself judged by it. There is such a mind also in the church. When under the enlightenment of the Spirit she judges and approves doctrine, she is unable to prove it and yet is most certain of having it. For as among philosophers no one judges general concepts, but all are judged by them, so it is among us with the mind of the Spirit. Who judges all things is judged by no one, as the Apostle says, 1 Corinthians 2, verse 16. But of this another time. Let this then stand. The church can give no promises of grace. What? Listen to that again. Martin Luther just said the Roman Catholic Church or anything calling it church, itself a church, can give no promises of grace. In other words, no sacraments. And if it grants sacraments, if it gives sacraments, it's not the church of Jesus Christ. The church does not give grace any more than it can create its own creator. Grace is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast, and only God can give it. And if man gives something that says it, it obtains grace for man, then it is a liar. The truth is not in it. Who's Martin Luther talking about? The Church of Jesus Christ 
for the church of Antichrist. Listen to what he said. Let this then stand fast, firm and fast. The church can give no promises of grace. That is the work of God alone. Solo gracia. Solo Christos. That's what he's saying. The church can't offer grace. Only God can give it. So how did the Roman Catholic Church get so filthy rich, incalculably rich, by saying that it is the fountain of grace? The Roman Catholic Church is the fountain of grace, according to the Roman Catholic Church. And so people buy that grace. That's how the Roman Catholic Church got so filthy and incalculably wealthy. But grace, according to the Scripture, is granted by God alone, as a gift alone, by faith alone. Look, you can't get it wrong. Not if you have the mind of Christ. You can't get this wrong. Clearly, we can distinguish between the holy and the profane here. Why the world is blind to it, I cannot comprehend. But the world is blind to it. Let this stand fast. The church can give no promises of grace. That is the work of God alone. Therefore, she cannot institute a sacrament. The Roman Catholic Church, no church can institute a sacrament. But even if she could, it still would not necessarily follow that ordination is a sacrament. For who knows which is the church that has the Spirit? For when such decisions are made, there are usually only a few bishops or scholars present. And it is possible that these may not be really the, the church. Let me, let me tell you a secret, Martin Luther. None of them are of the church of Jesus Christ. Surely, before Martin Luther died, he had to have come to this realization. Speaking of those bishops and scholars, he says this, All may err, as councils have repeatedly erred, particularly the Council of Constance, which erred most wickedly of all. Only that which has the approval of the Church Universal, and not of the Church of Rome alone, rests on a trustworthy foundation. What did he just do? He just called the church universal, not the Roman Catholic Church. Rome says that the Roman Catholic Church is the one holy Roman and apostolic church. But it's not the church universal, as it claims if church universal means the body of Christ. The fact of the matter is, nowhere in the Bible is the body of Christ called the universal church. Those are Rome's terms. Rome created them. She can do with them whatever she wants, even to dispense with them or change the meanings of the words. That's why you cannot trust one single word uttered by the Roman Catholic Church, especially if she has coined the term and defined it. If you create something, it's yours. Just as the potter who makes a pot out of clay may either make the pot to be honored or make the pot to be dishonored, or to destroy it altogether. 
That's the prerogative of the owner and the creator of something. Now, God describes himself as a potter, and he makes pots to be honored. He makes pots to be dishonored, and he makes pots to be destroyed. And it's through the knowledge and wisdom gained through the scriptures to be able to, to discern which are which. Now, the bishops and the scholars of the Roman Catholic Church are fallible men. They have erred throughout history, as all the councils of the Roman Catholic Church have erred, not just the Council of Constance, which erred most wickedly, according to Martin Luther, most wickedly of all. Only that which has the approval of the church universal and not of the Roman church alone rests on a trustworthy foundation. Therefore, I therefore admit that ordination is a certain churchly right on a par with many others introduced by the church fathers, such as the consecration of vessels, houses, vestments, water, salt, candles, herbs, and wine, and the like. You know what the Bible calls it? Wood, hay, and stubble. Wood, hay, and stubble. And it will all be consumed when the fire from heaven descends. He says, no one calls any of these sacraments, nor is there in them any promise in the same manner, to anoint a man's hands with oil or to shave his head and the like is not to administer a sacrament. Since no promise is attached to them, they are simply being prepared for a certain office like a vessel or an instrument. So what do we say of the priest, the herbs, the, the wine, the candles, the sacraments, the whole lot of the Roman Catholic Church is nothing nothing at all I'll see you tomorrow visit crosstheborder.org c-r-o-s-s -S, crosstheborder.org to get your print EPUB or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled When the Third Temple is Built that's crosstheborder.org when it comes to prophecy today, much of the evangelical Christian world has their eyes on Israel, waiting and watching to see when the third temple will begin to be built. The plans are drawn. The Jewish people are eager. Most evangelical Christians today believe that the rapture will happen before the third temple is built. Hi, I'm Michael Eugene. I was taught that Daniel's 70th week was in the future. Is that really what the Bible teaches? Have we searched the scriptures and found this to be true? Why is it so important for a re-established Israel to build a third temple in Jerusalem? Is it necessary to build a temple on the same location already occupied by the Dome of the Rock? Is it necessary for sacrifices to take place in the temple on Temple Mount? Is there really a rapture followed by seven years of tribulation? What is the New Testament temple? Can we identify history and prophecy? Who is the first beast in Revelation chapter 13? Who are the seven kings in Revelation 17? I have asked all these questions, and I have found Nicholas Arthur's new book, When the Third Temple is Built, answers all these questions and more using Scripture to interpret Scripture. The Bible says that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. Nicholas shows us in his new book, When the Third Temple is Built, how the Bible interprets prophecy and not man's private interpretation. Visit Cross the Border dot org c r o s s cross the border dot org to get your print epub or pdf version of nicholas arthur's new book titled when the third temple is built that's cross the border dot org